How are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm well. Hey, before we get going, I should ask, um, what pronouns would you like me to use for our conversation? Oh, any. Use adverbs and adjectives, I think. So that's, that's more. It's, it's, but I came out 36 years ago, and, and so that's the important date. So 1985, we should date the girl. But pronouns, you know, I, I'm gender fluid. I do things in boy mode, girl mode. So this, this is all in boy mode. So I'd go, I'd go with male, with he and him stuff. We'll go. Uh, on. But it, it, it does trip people up a bit, and it's not designed to. So I don't want it to. So whatever you want is basically. Grand, no, it's a, your, your, your preference, of course, and we can, we, can, we can do he and him, no problem. Okay. So um, we were just talking about this. I think we should pick it up so that people who listen to the radio can hear what we're talking about as opposed to the story we were telling off the air. I didn't know about this story. I didn't know the story about an English finishing school where Nazi children went to school. How did you find out about this place? Tell us a little bit about it. Well, no one knows. It's sitting there. It's it's because our story that sits on top of it is one that came out of our minds and is a 39 steps to Hitchcocky and um, it's got elements of different things, even up to the Ipcrest file in there. Um, but uh, I, live, I was at this, lived in this place called Bexel on Sea. Now, for Canadians, uh, they, it's the south coast of England, so they, they could probably get that. There's a place called Hastings, Battle of Hastings, might well have been heard hey. of in America. So that's Hastings is five miles from us. So it's that there. Brighton is another big town down on the south coast. So it's in that kind of area where the the Operation Sea Line Zelo was going to happen when the when the Nazis were going to come in. If they did come in, they were going to come straight past our house. Um, but this was before the war, and there was there were twenty six schools in this town, which is bizarro. You know who has twenty six schools in a town? Uh, but this one did, and it's due to the fact that it was it's an on sea any of the on sea places they were set up as health spa kind of things. Come to to the Bexel on Sea, the trains, the new trains in the 1800s have been set up, and and there was money. The Delaware family had helped set it up, and and uh, royalty used to turn up and stay, and they did the first ever motor race in there. So that's why there were 26 schools, and uh, the sons and daughters of empire used to stay there. But one was also a fish, finishing school not a fishing school, but a finishing school for, and it seemed German girls went there to learn English, to get to know other members of the British aristocracy, because a lot of British aristocracy, including Edward VIII, were into the Nazis. And you had the black shirts in Britain, which was Oswald Mosley, and he was married to Dylan Mitford, another member of the aristocracy. Hitler was at there, was a witness at their wedding. And um, so all these kinds of uh, posh elites uh, who were extreme right wing, um, were, were just into make, making friends and the girls were there to learn English and make friends too and listen to Hitler's speeches. They were listening to Hitler's speeches in Bexhill on Sea in England on the radiogram and then saluting the, the radio set uh, at the appropriate points of Zieg Heiling. Zieg Heiling, the radio set. So we know this happened. They know it went on and we know they were there and the, the Bund Deutsches Mädel, uh, League of German Maidens, were they, were they were all part of and they had this Nazi swastika on their T-shirts. And uh, so we built a story on that. I just, I found that because of the blazer badge. The blazer badge had the British flag and the Nazi flag on it. If you've seen the film, you saw it right at the beginning being woven. That is the badge that started it all. I was shown a picture of that. I thought, whoa, there's a film in that. And that's become my first film. I, I find it interesting that you say there's a film in that because I think the story you told just then would easily make a great, would have made a great um, like historical documentary or podcast or something like that. It still can. And but yeah. you 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 tell a great sort of. Uh, I want to point out for people who don't know the film, a great sort of popcorny thriller out of it. Yeah. And what made you want to go that route? Well, that's more commercial. You know, um, I want to <laughs> works. I'm the kid who sat there eating popcorn and likes the film. So I I I like thrillers. I like action movies. I like. Uh, uh, I'm not an intellectual. I, I I like emotional movies, and so. Uh, Putting a thriller on top of this seemed good. It was, you know, clock was ticking. It's called Six Minutes to Midnight. It's, um, uh, and it was all about when certain people, because you might think World War II was about countries being bad and countries being good, but it's in fact ideas being bad and ideas being good. And we know that because 90 years later, we've spun around, not necessarily in Canada, but in Britain and in, in uh, America, extreme right wing ideas abound again. And they're, you know, behind the surface, Marine Le Pen in France and, the alternative für Deutschland back in Germany, you know, so the extreme people, they didn't go away. They just went quiet for a bit after the Second World War and then they'd come back and back and Trump gave them permission to come out and 
get the Confederate flag out again and assault the seat of democracy and all this kind of stuff. So lies, using, using lies as a tool of democracy, that is the dangerous thing. It happened 90 years ago. Um, and some people are saying, hey, let's try the 1930s again. So our film is a, like a little lesson from history. Uh, if you do not learn from your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So what's, what's, the lesson you, what, what's the lesson you think inherent in the film? Well, the lesson is, this is it. If they were these, these children were being beguiled by a guy who was lying. He was quite happy to lie. He was a criminal. The Nazis were a criminal organization. who were quite happy to put lie upon lie. The Jews did this. The Jews didn't do any of this. And then the Jewish Bolshevik conspiracy. If you think about it, the Bolsheviks were known. What were they known about? Because it was supposed to be no money. Money wasn't a part of the thing. Everyone on the equal. What were the Jewish people being, what was it What was it claimed that the Jewish people were all about? They were all about money, all about making loads and loads of money. So the people who made money were to get together with people who didn't make money and have what kind of conspiracy? A conspiracy of disagreement? It was a nonsense from the beginning. The whole area and idea of inbreeding of people, we know that leads, leads to congenital defects. It was a bad idea to start off with. It was just lies upon lies upon lies. And Goebbels came up with this thing, which Hitler agreed with. It, the big lie is much easier to sell than little lies. And Trump proved this as he said, uh, oh, I, I won that election that I've lost. And he kept saying he won it and won it. And people in America still believe, some of them still believe this. And that is insane because it's an utter, utter lie. Even Republican officials are saying, no, you cannot strong arm us. You cannot bully us into doing this, uh, Mr. Trump. We, you know, we will not turn this election over for you. So that's the lesson that these ideas didn't go away. Lying is very beguiling as a tool of politics. And the right wing uses it all over the place. You're generous, not to the people who are doing the lying, of course, but I feel like you're generous to those who are lied too. And I, in the context I mean that in is that in the film, it feels like you go out of your way to have a kindness or an empathy or a generosity to these young girls, these young children of Nazis who were in the school. Well, yes, I would have said, yeah, I would say that's fair, that you could have had them all raging Nazis. Now, the truth is, is, is what we know is that if you have a minority that are raging right wing, they, they use the violence and threat of violence to push other people to go along with it. So some people just go along with it. And so that, that, that takes it from the minority because the Nazis were always a minority. It never got more than a third of the vote. And they push the other floating set of people into going along with them. And then even uh, other people who disagree with this, they either have to be exiled or they have to stand up against it or were shot, they were murdered. This was back in the 30s or they were put in the concentration camps and eventually murdered. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do. We you tend to look at Nazi Germany and think, well, almost nobody disagreed. No, it's almost nobody actually agreed. It's just that once you're forced to do this at gunpoint, then everyone tends to agree. And you can see that in Soviet Russia as well. No one could disagree because they knew that Stalin would, you'd be off to the death camps, you're off to the gulags immediately, and in the military as well. I mean, uh, um, Pinochet used this. He used the caravan of death. Which, you know, uh, Margaret Thatcher's best friend, uh, General Pinochet, who she, she just supported him all the time. This was a mass murder. He used the caravan death. He used to push people out of airplanes. They, they used deaths in such a, uh, a brutal way that no one, even in their own side, would think of, of going against him because they might end up being uh, murdered by the caravan of death idea. So it was uh, important or, for you, it was important for these girls to be seen as sort of victims themselves. Yeah, it's important to see them... Uh, in a, in a more in a more open-minded uh, state as opposed to they've all been brainwashed and that's it. You've just got big old Nazi girls and, you know, that's your story. There cause, and it, it, it also didn't quite work in our story. But I think they were probably more overtly pro-Nazi than we were painting them. But we painted some of them that way, some of them just fun-loving girls. And, and Gretel plays the, the one girl that's pushing against it. And she represents, there's a famous photograph of, uh, of about 500 people doing a Nazi salute and one guy who was who was refusing to do the salute. It's a famous one that if people Google they can they can find it. Um, but it takes such strength to push against that. And, uh, you know, so there but for the grace of humanity, we all go again. So we just got to watch out because I think the 21st century is the coming of age of humanity. And this century, we decide it all, whether we're going to become a, a world where it's a fair chance for everyone or whether we just go down this extreme right wing way of everyone hating one country, hating another country, people's hating another people, using lies as a tool of politics. It's certainly not hard. It was certainly hard to watch the film 
which is about 1939 and not think about now, as you said. I want to play you something, and this is not from the film, but it's sort of tangential to you and the film. Take a listen to okay. this. Hey, mama, don't you treat me wrong. Come and love you, daddy, all right long, all right. That is the immortal Ray Charles. And um, what I say, Eddie Izzard is, is with me. Eddie stars opposite Dame Judi Dench in Six uh, Minutes to Midnight. Why am I playing that for you? Well, well me and Judi danced to this song. I was listening to this song. And we just, we were, this is the previous film we did together, uh, Victoria and Abdul. And she played Queen Victoria and I played her son, Bertie, who became Edward the Seven. And so with de-robing, uh, you know, me, Edward, still Edward the Seventeenth, her still kind of Queen Victoria, and playing this track. And I was just sort of dancing around to it. And then she started dancing in front of me. And it was just, it was one kind of amazing moment. And two, I realized that she was dancing like a young teenage girl. She still has that. She can access that part of herself. She's just still a fun loving person. And that's why she's so vibrant in anything that she plays because she can access any age of her life any part of her life at a moment's notice so um and she got a great sense of humor as well but it's it's kind of interesting to have that uh that dance going on and that happened i i've heard you be critical of your acting in the past you know and i know you have yeah. a, you have a strange relationship with acting you know and i think i think a lot of stand-ups or a lot of one-man performers or you know a lot of performers do stage performers do yeah how do you find working with dame judy dench i would imagine is there a part of you that's a bit intimidated by it? Well, um, I've tried in my life to push all intimidation back. You know, it's fear. You know, if you're performing in, I'm living in French, you stand up in French and German and Spanish, your fear tends to go away. If you come out as trans, your fear tends to go away. If you're running marathon upon marathon, your fear goes back. And so that is what I, uh, I've tried to do in life. And as regards acting, when I was seven, I wanted to act. And then I, I wasn't getting any roles at school. I discussed, realized that there's a separate area for comedy and I love comedy. So I thought, well, let's just do that then. And then it took so long for that to take off that then I added back in drama uh, in my early 30s and I, and I have separate agents and I pushed in, in these two directions at the same time, which is kind of an odd thing to do. But um, I, my early work, I had comedy muscles developed and I knew I needed to switch them off. So what, if you have instincts developed and you switch them off and you start doing your early dramatic roles, which will be kind of small scenes, so you're not going to have a huge amount. It won't be rehearsal. Mm. You'll be going in and you'll be shooting, say, half a day, and then maybe that's the end of your film. Uh, so you don't have a huge chance to get your feet under the table. Um, yeah. All I had was, was no instincts, and I'd switched <laughs> off my, my, my comedy instincts, and that was a good thing, but it meant that I was a little bit awash, a little bit at sea, in the early roles, which is unfortunate, and maybe I could have done it a better way, but I couldn't work out how to get experience without getting experience. It's it's a chicken and egg situation. And then through, uh, particularly in the riches, the riches were probably drama school and film school for me, all in one, uh, in one go. Uh, for FX, John Langroff let me come and play that role. I was part of the group that was pitching the idea, so I was already in there, and. Um, and I got stronger and stronger through the through that, so that I could. Uh, there came a point where I thought, I now know what I'm doing, and I had to. I had to just go through this baptism of fire, and now I'm doing dramatic roles and surreal comedy in different languages, and and they're running parallel. They're not crossing each other over, which is interesting. Well, what, what's interesting about that is it even brings us back to this film right now. You know, you you co-wrote this film as your first screenwriting venture, and similarly to what you were just talking about. I understand that part of the reason for doing that was to make sure to secure a good leading role for yourself so that you could yeah. call first dibs on it. What, what, what prompted you taking matters in your own hands that way? Are you not seeing enough interesting roles coming your way? Well, no, I'm getting interesting roles, but, and they're getting better and better, but you know, they tend to be more supporting. They wouldn't think, hey, that trans person who's, who's slightly older now, let's go and give them that lead. Because you tend to be, there's a certain look that main lead roles get uh if you look into what can green light a film um there's certain things certain directors certain places certain mix of, of acting a great script um so for me 
I thought I should I should set up my own film to give myself a good lead role. But this is this is not unknown. In fact, all the A-listers do it anyway. Or they may not write the script, but they will they will buy, they will option a, a property, you know, a book and say, that's a good role for me. I'd like to buy this. And then they say, we'll develop this. And they give themselves the big lead role. Exactly what I'm doing. So if the A-listers have to do it, then me, I'm maybe B plus, A minus, I consider myself. <laughs> that, I'm, I definitely have to do it. And that's the way forward. And I want to make films. I want to direct films. I broke into Pyman Studios, one of our big studios here in Britain, when I was 15. So 40 years later. You broke in? Yeah, just like Spielberg broke into Universal when he was 17. Um, I broke in. I just, I I walked in the front door, basically. I I, I found out where it was. I I got it from a film. I You know, I'm very military in how I get things done. So I was watching films in the 70s in my teenage years. And I would copy down... Uh, notes from the, the titles as they went at the end of because there was no internet there was no, you couldn't even stop the the um, the uh, screen to read what was on there and at the end of Battle of Britain it says made in uh, filmed in in Spain and on location in Spain and, and England I think and it says and also in Pinewood Studios Ivor Heath Bucks so I wrote that down I said there's a studio they make these things in studios okay so that that that, that must be a, a studio. Uh, and Ivor Heath Bucks, it didn't quite make sense. I don't know what is that. That must be a place. That must be a place. And I had to go and get a map with every town and village and city of in the UK listed alphabetically, which you used to have in those days, and track down. Yes, it is. It's kind of a village, and there's a studio built right near this village. So I had to go train to London from the south, from Bexhill on Sea, where our film is set, and then to London, then tube to Uxbridge Underground Tube. And then a bus to Ivor Heath and got out and said, is there a film studio around here, man? Yeah, come on, studio. It's half a mile down the road. All right, thanks, mate. And then I walked down. I walk up to the main gate and said, and I thought, oh, I haven't quite got the, the, the how do I get in? Um, aha. Um, you know, yeah, what, what is it? What is it, kid? Yeah, I've come to, uh, I'm going to be in films. Uh, I want to be in films. And um, so I, I need to come in, really. <laughs> what? What's that? Harry, hang on a sec. Where's that, man? No, I've got to. Can I come in? I want to be a. a I want to eventually lead roles. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> think the same, but yeah, no, they, they just, just just piss off, kid. You know, just what? Yeah, you can't come in. No, you can't. Come in. So I thought I've come miles. I'm not going to give up. Then I don't give up. And then there was another entrance, just a little further up, which has now become the main entrance. And I watched, and I, in the end, I, I realized if you just walked in with confidence, you could get in because they were only checking people who looked like they needed their stuff checked. And I walked in like Richard Burton and Clint Eastwood did into the Schloss Adler in Where Eagles Dare. That was the same attitude. They were discussing having sex with a woman called Fred uh, in a very English accent. They weren't even pretending to do German accents. Um, and I just marched in at a certain speed. I marched at a certain speed. That thing is not too fast, not too slow, certain speed. And then I moved around Pinewood for two hours at a certain speed, ha- hardly stopping in case someone said, hey, stopped kid. What are you doing, stop kid? You must be a wrong kid. But in fact, there's so many so many different departments there, so different films, different businesses in there. But no, once you're in, no one really plays a blind bit of notice. But it didn't, didn't, it know- didn't happen. No one looked at you and said, "That's there's, there's our new yeah. star. I wanted someone to say, Hey, you kid, moving at a certain speed. There's a kid just exploded in here. Can you can you speak English? Yes, I, I just about. All right, you're in. You're the lead role. <laughs> you know, that's what I wanted to happen. I mean, Spielberg got off and he got in. He stayed in the loose on the Universal tour. Then he went off and he got an office. And apparently, he was turning up every day to the office, which I think it's it's turning into an apoc- uh, kind of a story that's got bigger and bigger. I don't know if that necessarily was the beginning of his career. But um, that's what he did do, and, that, and I kind of did the same. His career took off immediately. Mine took off more like a fine wine. Like slowly. a fine, yeah, like slowly with age. I understand, I understand. Yeah. I, uh, Eddie, at the beginning, I don't want to take up too much of your time here, but at the beginning of our conversation, I asked you, you know, what, what are your preferred pronouns? And you said, ah, you know, well, you know whatever, there's, there's, a big, there's a big deal made out of it. Um, yeah. And in December, it was a big headline, right? Uh, yeah. when, when you said she, her. It wasn't in tended, I know, to be some big reveal on your part. The press kind of went mad with it and t- turned it into your coming out parties if you haven't come out years before that. How did all this attention affect you? Um, I uh, I got a different... I, I don't know. Well, nothing. I'm slightly surprised because, one, there's... Uh, one had come out in 1985, so that's... You know, how much notice does everyone need? 35 years? Is that enough? <laughs> 
you want another 10 years to get a client? They said, she and her. But when you were wearing the dresses, the make, we thought that was a tax thing. I mean, I don't know what people were thinking. So I don't know why everyone was surprised. Um, some people are very negative. Say, how much, yeah, how much notice do you need? But uh, it, yeah, I came out 35 years ago. So now it's 36 years ago. And uh, it's, this is a language adjustment. And I'm not bothered because I'm gender fluid. So in, in film roles, I will be playing in boy roles. I, I call it boy mode, girl mode, because I consider being trans a superhero thing. Uh, just like the human torch can go flame on, flame on. I can do the similar boy on, girl on. And, um, and that's it. And that's how I've lived my life. And I've got everyone got to know this over a slow period of time. But suddenly it was grabbed hold of. Um, and even a year before, I'd been given an honorary degree in Swansea, which is one of the big cities where I need, used to live, actually, in, in, in Wales. And so I was given an honorary degree. The chancellor of the university started calling me she and her in her re read-up when she was mentioning me. And I thought, oh, that's very nice. I said, thank you for that. That's a very nice of you to do. And then the press picked up on that, and it was uh, on Wales Online. And then the, the, uh, the Daily Mail, which is a very, you know, conservative slash right-wing paper in our country that always looking for gossip. What's going on? What's this? Can we have a statement? So I put a statement out over a year and a half before that, even though I came out a million years ago. And so that was done and dusted then, and no one gave a dicky bird. You know, nothing happened. No picked up. Nothing going viral. And then a year and a, and a bit later, it goes completely viral. I mean, around the world. IMDB, which people know in the film world, and, uh, and Wikipedia, my pronouns changed like that. Zuh, 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 zuh. It was a fuh, 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 fuh. And then all the, all the you know, you know, all media stations and TV and radio stations, you spend, so, and I feel I've been promoted to she, and it's a great honor, but it shouldn't be the big thing. I'm not all about pronouns. I'm more about adverbs. I think adverbs, <laughs> uh, fastly, he ran fastly, she ran fastly. Is that an adverb? I think so. I think well, adverbs have to be on. Well, well, speaking of running fastly, can you, can you tell me about this Make Humanity Great Again fundraising campaign? Yes, Make Humanity Great Again is a slogan that I came up with. I have no idea how it came to me, but one night, one day, it came, and I thought, whoa, where did that come from? And then I had some other guy who had a similar slogan. But Yeah, I, I heard about that too, but he's gone now from what I hear. He's Lost. Gone into a, he's gone to Florida, <laughs> which is where you retired to, I think. So you ran, you ran a bunch of marathons. How many marathons did you run? Well, I... In my time now, it's 130 uh, marathons. But I, I, back in 2009, I did 43 and 51 days. And then I went to South Africa, did 27, 27 days uh, in 2016. That was a salute to Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison. So I thought I could raise money and salute to the, to the great man. And then in 20, what did it be, 2020, I ran uh, 29 marathons, 29 days around Europe, around the capitals of Europe. And then I did 32 marathons in 31 days with a double marathon at the end uh, in lockdown on a treadmill Jeez. talking to people and had George Clooney at the end doing the countdown. So, so we got down to well, having run 13 hours did two marathons and doing a gig at the end of each marathon. So that leads me to maybe a good place to close it off, which is you tell me the, the story of, you know, you wanted to be an actor when you were a kid. You were sort of left out of acting. You wanted to work in the movies. You could break into the studio. You try your best, but that doesn't happen. You see, my career sort of went like a, like a, fine, a fine wine. And then you're telling me about, you know, running all these marathons. I find if I'm on the treadmill for more than 25 minutes, I'm bored to tears. Where yeah. does the, I mean, but largely, where does your persistence in your life come from? I might have a determination gene. I might just have that genetic. I'm not sure because I, I, I tracked it back. I was looking at my school reports and Edward really is a determined little boy uh, from someone uh, was in there. I don't know what that was about, but I used to do odd things to get into things um, like the, I was not into being in the choir because somebody said being in the choir is really girly and I wasn't out at this point. So I was like, I want to be girly because I don't, you know, boy stuff because, you know, make sure boy and girl genetics. And I wasn't telling anyone about girl genetics. So I was not in the school choir. No way. My mother actually sang, but and I, and I thought it was good. And I remember just walking, you had to walk across the, the aisle. There was an aisle and two sets of desks and I just moved across. And, and then later on, you know, a number of years later, anyone in the choir could go, was in this production of uh, Joseph and his Technicolor Dream Club. Great, you know, uh, Tim Rice and... Um, um, and Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah, Andrew Lloyd Webber. And uh, great songs in there and lyrics. And 
And I thought, oh, I want to be in that. You know, I want to be an actor. I want to be in that. That's great. And it's also fun stuff. It's not singing hymns. You know, it's good stuff. So what am I age? I'm about 11 or 12. And so I just went and stood in the room. I went, so when they, they'd have a meeting, they'd have things, okay, everyone meet for the thing. And I stood in the room with all the choir and I'm not supposed to be there. So I just stand there and I go to all the meetings and they'd say, we're going to move the table. And I'd run in and I'd move the table and uh, I'd just help them with it. Can we get the air? And I'd get, so I just became the fetch and carry person, like a, almost like a stage manager, but no one had asked me to. No one checked why I was there. And I became a very, you know, ne- I made myself necessary. So I suddenly was in it. And then I had a solo line in it even when uh, the, one of the teachers playing uh, Elvis, he has, you know, playing Pharaoh, and he's got this thing, Ears of Corn, I don't know, some sort of song that he sings. And I was saying, tell us about it, Pharaoh. You know, so I got a line. <laughs> so I would push my way into things. If, I, if they wouldn't allow me to be in things, like breaking into studios, like I, I would just do things that are not quite on, on the standard track. I mean, I wanted to be in Special Forces when I was a kid, and that's quite serious. I was quite seriously planning to do that. And instead, I've done civilian Special Forces, I think, in coming out as trans, running 130 marathons, performing, stand up in French, German, and Spanish, as well as English, I think, uh, and now making films, which is always what I wanted to do in the first place. That's It's great to be here with this film, Six Minutes to Midnight, and... Uh, I think people will like it. My brother likes it, and he doesn't like stuff that I do. So, oh, your, bro- your brother's a bit hard on you, but he likes this one. Yeah, he can, he says that one's good. He will tell me that one. The film, another film I did. There's one other film I did that was good, and uh, and he won't. He'll be very reluctant to give him praise. Well, so I'm that's... I'm glad you got him on board at least. You know, and I tell you, it's a it's a it's a really tremendous film. I I didn't know the story at all and and it was one of those films that made me read about eight articles afterwards about it so right hey lovely to talk to you very good to talk to you and uh yes thanks uh a lot of good information you have so great to talk to you